Hi everyone, my name is Lauren and I am currently studying towards my Masters in Modern and Contemporary Literature at Hertford College here in Oxford. So I'm going to be presenting on the critical relationships between author, reader and text. As literature students, we are all readers, but we rarely think about the status of reading, critically or conceptually. Reading is often seen as simply a vessel, close reading as an exam exercise or reading in your spare time for pleasure. But in this presentation, I want to draw your attention to the ways that different texts demand or ask for different reading practices, where reading isn't just a medium that you do in class or at the library, but is a significant and complex critical activity worthy of consideration in its own right. In light of this then, our objectives will be as follows. 1. To identify different types of readers. 2. To evaluate the varying relationships between the reader, the writer and the text and free to critically engage in literary theory. So we'll begin with some literary historical examples here. I've given you two quotations, one from the Victorian writer and critic John Ruskin, taken from his lecture series called Sesame and Lilies, which was first given in Manchester in 1864 in support of a library fund, and the second from the French writer Marcel Proust's 1905 preface to John Ruskin's lectures, which he titled On Reading. I've chosen these two quotations because Proust is directly responding to Ruskin, raising a space for dialogue in which we can identify both points of similarity and difference. So take two minutes to briefly analyse these quotations, keeping in mind how they both compare and contrast. So here is my analysis of the Ruskin quotation. For me, the verb use, as opposed to read, the verb normally associated with books, immediately suggests that Ruskin sees books as a means to an end. This, I think, is reinforced by the clause to be led by them, where Ruskin personifies the books in order to cast the reader as a passive follower, being led to a final destination via reading. Alongside the mention of help, I think that this culminates to propose reading as, ultimately, a didactic activity. It's clear that Ruskin believes that this should be the only way to read, his mention of rightly necessarily implies that there must also be a way to read wrongly. So take two minutes here to compare my analysis to your own. Were there any points that we agreed on or even disagreed on? Note them down and then proceed on to the next slide. Moving on to the Proust quotation then, the adjective dangerous at the start makes it clear that like Ruskin, Proust believes that there is one singular way to read. To do the opposite may even cause harm. And yet, unlike Ruskin, who indicates that the reader must become passive for the purpose of reading, Proust focuses on the individual experience of the reader, as emphasised by his language of individual inner life. Knowing that Proust is directly responding to Ruskin allows us to perceive this critique more strongly. The final sentence, for example, when truth starts to seem like a material thing deposited in the pages of books, appears to be a direct critique of Ruskin's idea that books can didactically lead the reader into wisdom. And so again, just take two minutes here to reread the quotation and to compare my analysis to your own. To summarise all of this analysis, and to bring our comparing and contrasting to the fore, I've noted three key points here. The first, that both Ruskin and Proust suggest that there is a singular way to read rightly, but their views on what this method consists of differ. Secondly, that Ruskin perceives reading as instrumental, whereas Proust understands reading as a valuable activity in and of itself. And finally, that for Ruskin, the reader must take on a passive role to the book itself, but for Proust, the reader as an individual becomes most important. Don't worry if you came up with different points of comparison. There is no one answer, and part of the wonder of this topic is the way that it reveals to us how each of us have our own distinct and individual methods of both reading and also interpretation. Moving away from these earlier writers then, I now want to introduce some trickier critical theory. What I'm going to focus on is a theory called reader response theory. Reader response theories gained prominence in the late 1960s, arguing that a text has no meaning before a reader experiences or reads it. These theories of reading were popularised in both the United States and in Germany, 
by key critical thinkers including Stanley Fish, David Bleich, Wolfgang Eiser and Roland Barthes. To focus on one example, let us turn to the French literary theorist, essayist, philosopher and critic Roland Barthes. You might have heard of him before. He is notable for his influence on many schools of theory, including structuralism, semiotics, anthropology and post-structuralism. The aspect of his work that I want to draw attention to here, though, is his 1967 essay, The Death of the Author, a central critical text in reader response theory and a seminal text in the ongoing theorising of reading more generally. Like before, I've picked out some key quotations, here all from Barth's essay, The Death of the Author. Here is the first one. The explanation of a work is always sought in the man or woman who produced it, as if it were always the voice of a single person, the author, confiding in us. From page 143. Take a minute to read this again and consider what this might suggest about traditional literary authority. I won't be providing my own analysis again, so think of this as an opportunity to think a little bit more independently. This next quotation reads, To give a text an author is to impose a limit on that text, to furnish it with a final signified, to close the writing. From page 147. So at this time, consider how does Bart use capitalisation to enhance his meaning here? What do you also think is meant by close the writing? So the final quotation that I'd like you to consider is this one, from the very end of the essay. Classic criticism has never paid any attention to the reader. We know that to give writing its future, it is necessary to overthrow the myth. The birth of the reader must be at the cost of the death of the author from page 148. So after reading this again, think about what the new hierarchy is which Barthes proposes should exist between the reader and the author, and to add to this, how do the metaphors of life and death aid Barthes' intended meaning here? So I hope those quotations and answers led to some insightful reflections. The final question that I want to leave you with is this. How might the early literary theory by John Ruskin and Marcel Proust anticipate the later approach by reader response critical theory? Feel free to either pause the video now and take some notes and think about it here, or return to this question later after you've reflected and been able to properly compare and contrast the two different theories that we've looked at today. So, to summarise some key points from today. First, that meaning is not always objective and can be left open for the reader. Second, that the writer and reader exist in a relationship, both with the text and also to each other. And finally, the status of the reader is constantly evolving, both historically and critically. I hope you found this helpful and even possibly inspiring. For me, this topic is such a fascinating and engaging one because I think that considering these trajectories in such a way can help us to trace a wider genealogy of critical reading, one that I think, and also hope, has the potential to illuminate our own reading practices, and as Proust would say, our own individual inner beings. Finally, here are some things you can do after watching this video. First, you can read the full Roland Barthes essay, which I've provided on a separate link attachment. You can check out the recommended reading list, which I've put together, which includes books, podcasts and video clips. And then you can think about how these theories could apply to a work of literature you've read recently, whether that be at school, for your own pleasure reading, or for some extracurricular reading you've been doing in preparing your application. Do these theories of reading add to your analysis, complicate it, or change it? So, I hope this has been helpful, and thank you for watching.